Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Let's talk about Rick Owens' Spring Summer 2023, a runway titled Edfu. I'm a big fan of show notes, and Rick makes all of his show notes available in the description of his runway shows on YouTube. Let's read. This season's women's spring collection, like the men's spring collection before it, is named Edfu, after the Egyptian temple on the west bank of the Nile in Egypt. I have been retreating to Egypt, where I find great comfort in the remoteness and scale of its history. My personal concerns and the global discomforts feel small in the face of that kind of timelessness. Lying down in the dirt with the Valley of the Kings within view is a very soothing perspective. The temples started by one civilization, seized and added on to by another, completed by another, and then unearthed by yet another are reassuring in their stoic permanence. In my youth, Egypt had always been the setting of the morality stories I had learned in Catholic school, and in the silent movie books in my parents' basement, featuring Cecil B. DeMille's biblical epics, and movies starring Theda Bara, a creature dressed as an exotic ancient femme fatale who was originally born Theodosia Goodman in Cincinnati, Ohio. These movies became my aesthetic recipe, ancient stories about faith and higher purpose mixed with a camp and lurid exoticism seen through a turn-of-the-century black-and-white Art Nouveau filter. With a dose of self-invention, Theta's fierce and powerful and, frankly, artificial self that understood and acknowledged the light and darkness of real life. Channeling Theta Bara, posing for Gustav Moriu, Sinuous gowns in translucent leather turn the wearer into a 700 million year old jellyfish, gracefully and languriously trailing sheer and serpentine trains. Full grain cow hides collected as a waste product from the food industry are tanned using only organic materials and natural glycerin that fill the pores of the leather and give it its softness and transparency like wearing a gelatinous fruit roll-up. Continuing a jellyfish silhouette, bell-shaped frilled jackets stop at the waist or at the hips or explode into huge mantles constructed from 200 meters of recycled tool made using a conil, an Italian yarn made from recycled waste materials collected from oceans and landfills. Pearl, Oyster and ivory gowns and jackets in ripstop nylons also provide butterfly wing lightness with graph-like constructions that lend subtle soothing gridding on the body in Dyneema, which is a patented fiber considered to be the strongest in the world. Como woven silk charmuses and chiffons are cut into gowns that twist around the hips and trail on the floor in slashes of slithering color. Gowns also come in denims that are draped and slashed in faded or lacquered finishes. Colors are either milky non-colors or stridently bright like yellow, pink, or fuchsia. Jubilantly loud colors that can equal the power of black. Shoulders are either wide and rounded on shield-shaped blouson or sharp and narrow on tees and flight jackets, extending and narrowing and elongating the arms into parentheses framing the body. By exaggerating or distorting the body in such a pronounced way, the message is a vote for otherness, a departure from tasteful and perhaps narrow aesthetic conventions and maybe an encouragement to consider open-mindedness in other areas outside of personal appearance as well. 100% of our cotton jerseys are organic GOTS certified cotton. 90% of our cotton wovens are organic certified cotton. I'm not listing our efforts in recycling out of virtuousness. We definitely have room to improve. But I love having the idea that efforts in responsibility and kindness can help in some small way to balance out forces of aggression and war. I don't see my sojourns to Egypt as escapism, but as a way to remind myself to look at the big picture and to relividly admire what survives after countless wars. 
First, we're going to look a little bit closer at the more literal details from this show, and then we're going to take some time to dig into the more abstract stuff that's, that's going to be a little bit more fun. These pieces right here are super interesting. It feels like they should be a direct reference to a specific piece of art, and I haven't been able to find one that matches up exactly, but I do have an educated guess as to what we're looking at here. I think these are a reference to Rick's continued interest in Joseph Albers and the Bauhaus movement more generally. He actually referenced Annie and Joseph Albers back in spring-summer 2020, along with Louis Barragan, who might have further inspired the colors for this season's pieces here. It could also maybe be a reference to James Terrell because of just kind of the way that the lines on this piece sort of go out very softly the way that light does in a lot of Terrell's pieces, but if I had to bet money on it, I'm, I'm going with Joseph Albers. We do have a precedent for that, so I'm sticking with them. Shifting gears here a little bit, Egypt has been with us for a while in Rick shows, even before the Edfu Diligy. The most obvious example of that being the headgear from the men's strobe show. Those were pretty clearly based off of the Egyptian god Amon, whose double-pronged crown was one of the most distinct visual motifs that would tell you in ancient Egyptian art, oh, that's Amon. And there's uh, also been just recent product like the sarcophagus keychain charm that's based off of the same sarcophagus that Rick was able to acquire and keeps at his Concordia home. It's interesting to note that the transparent leather technique here was originally made possible by fashion's resident madman, Cerule Recht. Our glorious madman, Cerule Recht. A number of years ago, he undertook the mission of making transparent leather possible for commercial purposes. It had been achieved before Cerule started on this project. Uh, the transparent leather had been achieved, but he was able to develop a technique that made transparent leather possible outside of the realm of experimentation. I also want to bring it back and kind of talk more narrowly about the shoulders this season. Shoulders have been, at least for me, the, the biggest highlight of the last few years of Rick Owen shows. We've had some really, really wild shoulder experimentation. But the shoulders that are the big emphasis from this season are kind of a completion of a mission that Rick has been on for his entire career, and that is to elongate the limbs as much as possible. For example, the, the kiss boots make the wearer's legs just impossibly long, especially the ones with the transparent heel where it really just looks like the wearer is uh, like the hooves of a horse. It really elongates those legs and just makes the, the person's legs feel just superhumanly long. Long, 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 long. And through all of the experimentation with shoulders the last few years, like the, the huge hulking shoulders that are almost like American football pads or the shoulders of a structured blazer that's eight sizes too big for you and others that kind of force you to take up space and almost make the wearer feel like an anime mecha. Or at least look like one. I don't know how she feels. She looks like an anime mecha to me. Those shoulders all were brilliant, of course, but when we switched in the recent seasons to this shoulder, the, the mission of elongating the arms as much as possible was kind of complete. It's always been done with very high arm holes. That's kind of how you're able to achieve like the longest appearing arm as if this is cut just as high up as possible and then you're able to really get this smooth line all the way down. But when you extend it up into the shoulder space to create this artificial shoulder, you then make it where just the arms seem as superhumanly long as the kiss boots make your legs appear. And again, in the, the show notes, Rick talks about how the shoulders, if they're high enough, they frame the face. And you, you remember him saying sharp and narrow on the tees and flight jackets, extending and narrowing and elongating the arms into parentheses, framing the body. And that's such a cool way of talking about it that it's like a parentheses. Because grammatically, parentheses should hold a word or words that are kind of being... Uh, like shoved into a sentence. The, the sentence should be able to function grammatically without the parentheses. It's truly like something that's being said aside. And it's interesting that Rick kind of makes the comparison between the people who wear his clothes and parenthetical statements. Just parenthetical people, like the exceptions, not fully fitting into the sentence standing off outside of the normal structure. It's, that's a really beautiful description for the people who, who are kind of in the cult of Rick Owens. Okay, so what, what else could this shoulder be? Is this apprehension? Is this fear, maybe? I mean, it does kind of look like someone who is kind of 
bunching up their shoulders as if they're, they're either very cold or very afraid of something, right? And that's fascinating because we know from previous episodes that I've done on Rick that his shoulders are always a conversation about power. And very recently, the shoulders were the power of defiance against certain doom. The shoulders were meant to be this conversation about walking towards your own mortality in a dignified, badass way. And here, with these shoulders, maybe that defiance is a little bit more apprehensive. Because, I mean, that, that certain doom, after all, it is certain. These shoulders also could possibly be a bird preparing to take flight. And that would align perfectly with the Edfu themes because that the actual temple of Edfu was made to honor the Egyptian god Horus, who is often depicted with the head of a falcon. But it's interesting because when birds are in that position just before they take off, where their wings are shrugged up behind their back, that's the time when they are simultaneously the most visually beautiful and the most susceptible to predators. So that one little motion that lasts less than a quarter of a second, there's this whole conflict with that, that part of a bird taking flight. And there's a lot that these little pieces of the show could possibly refer to, and none of them will be a clean one-to-one -one comparison because you know, Rick is not a normal designer. He doesn't use mood boards like other designers. So finding things where you're able to put one thing up next to another, you're never going to have a fully clean fidelity between those two things. But personally, I find the most compelling interpretation of this shoulder to be a reference to a decomposing body. And just a heads up, I'm not able to actually show you a decomposing body here because of YouTube's rule. Which is very silly because this is for educational purposes. So under certain circumstances, a decomposing body's shoulders will begin to kind of bunch up. And as the skin and the muscles and the tissue begin to decompose, it sort of leaves the skeleton with just this kind of ribboned skin over it that really emphasizes the sharp angularness that you can't really imitate if your you know, body is full of veins and muscles and sinew and stuff. So just the angle of those bunched shoulders becomes very extreme and, and does very closely resemble these shoulders here. And like a lot of symbolism, especially in fashion, there isn't a single explanation that's useful for us. Oftentimes, multiple and even conflicting interpretations can be used together. If you can see these interpretations as existing simultaneously and all being correct simultaneously, you can see the picture more clearly. Parentheses, apprehension, a bird taking flight, the Egyptian god Horus, and what's left of a human body. And that last one actually leads us into a major theme of this collection, permanence. And there's miniature attempts at permanence in the show itself. You remember that the show notes reference Dyneema, which is the, the strongest fabric in the world. There's Ripstop as well, which is a fabric that's engineered to continue functioning even after it's been punctured. The way that Ripstop is woven, it's, it's made, I think it was originally made for parachutes actually, so that if a bullet went through the parachute that it wouldn't just continue that rip and go all the way through and tear the parachute apart. It's built so that if there is a tear, the tear will stop at the next little section. <laughs> Even the huge tool looks, they, they achieve a kind of permanence by being made entirely out of recycled material. All of these fabrics are built to last even through extreme wear and tear, similar to the architecture of Egypt that has survived invasions and the elements for millennia. There's a recent interview where Rick had this incredible conversation with Derek Blasberg, and at one point they talk about Rick's late father. And this is a very consistent topic for Rick in interviews. He had a, he had a pretty complicated relationship with his dad. His dad was, by Rick's description, conservative, he was homophobic, he was racist, and, and he was very, very strict. I mean, he was the exact kind of dad that sort of makes that classic story of the rebellious teenager happen. He's the, the sort of dad that would make his kids say, like, I'm never going to be like him, and then spend the rest of their lives trying to fulfill that promise to themselves. But as time moved on, Rick's dad passed away a few years ago, and all of the movies that have provided the aesthetic basis for what he does now, those were movies that his dad introduced him to. Rick loves classical music and opera. That was music that his dad forced the entire house to listen to almost every single day. And Rick resented him for it at the time. Now he loves that music. Time keeps moving, generations pass, 
And while there isn't a literal permanence, everything is kind of leaving its mark in some kind of bizarre way. And I mean, speaking of all of this, did you know that Rick is a grandfather now? I did not know that before I started researching for this episode. But there's something about having multiple generations behind you going and seeing your grandkids that I imagine starts making you kind of wonder about permanence. Because there is a sign when you look at a small child and you go, that's my granddaughter. There, there's no uncertainty then that it's like, I'm getting older. And maybe that's why Egypt has appealed so much to Rick in the last couple of years. There is this strange permanence to that place. Because like he said in the show notes, there are these monuments that have survived multiple invasions, thousands of years, and, and they're not surviving as little objects behind pressurized glass cases. These are out in nature, being rained on and walked on by thousands of people every week. As much as it can be said about a physical object, they're millennia old and they're still living their lives. These are some of the closest things to permanence that we have in the world of things. And ultimately, nothing, nothing does last, but there's just like a part of people that wants things to last. And maybe there's something, I mean, I'm, I'm 33, um, but I, I wonder if maybe as people get later on in life, if they stop asking the question, how do I make this thing that I really love last? And they start wondering, is there anything at all that lasts? Like he compares the transparent leather to fruit roll-ups, which seems just kind of like a funny flippant comment at first, but fruit roll-ups are a uh, food that is for all intents and purposes immortal. It's just sugar and glucose. It, it really doesn't have an expiration date. They could probably survive a nuclear apocalypse. And then there's the, the lyrics to the song that plays, which is Dazzle by Susie and the Banshees. The opening lyrics are the stars that shine and the stars that shrink. In the face of stagnation, the water runs. Before your eyes, swallowing diamonds, a cutting throat. Your teeth, when you grin, reflecting beams on tombstones. It's a song that talks about fading into the natural cycle of death that comes for everyone and everything. Rick also refers to the 700 million year old jellyfish, which is a reference to the discovery that some jellyfish are biologically immortal, which I had no idea about. Apparently, when these jellyfish reach a place of starvation or if they get punctured, they don't die. They just revert back to their baby state and then just start over again. It's very, very bizarre. And since that discovery, scientists have been trying to figure out a way to sort of link the, the cellular structure of what's going on in a jellyfish and make that happen in people. And of course, we, we have not cracked the code on that yet. And for those of us who are much younger than Rick, this fixation on permanence is with all of us. I mean, that's why we're all compulsively recording things with our phones. This isn't some sad habit and it's not a sign that the internet has destroyed our attention spans. This is people at a Rick Owens runway show. They're trying to turn that experience into something that can endure. We're kind of looking for this permanence that we can't ever actually find. Everyone does. It's just, I don't know, that's just kind of like part of what being a person is. The, the search for permanence. That's it. Go join that Patreon. You get to see extended episodes, exclusive episodes. You get to join the private Discord server, which is the best place to talk about fashion on the internet. I absolutely love that place. I'm, I'm literally going to go keep talking to people on there as soon as I'm done filming this. You all mean a lot to me. Thanks so much for your attention. I really appreciate you. I'll see you next week. Peace.